Folks, hello and welcome to week two. Uh, we're going to jump into chapter six this week, which is on mathematical forecasting. When you think of that word in the context of uh, weather forecasting, we know what that means. And uh, for this week, it really means the same thing. What we're going to do is we're going to use some information from the past, some knowledge from the past, and help us make an assessment uh, or a forecast uh, on the future. And as you've gone through the reading, what you're going to see is we're going to do this based on what is called time series data. And this first problem that I'm going to look at, by the way, uh, before I get started, I got three problems teed up for you this week, 6, 5, 6, 19. I'll probably do these first two by themselves. 625 is a little more involved. I don't, uh, I think that's straight up. That's not algorithmic, but I believe the first two are. So as you look at your homework set, uh, you'll probably have a little bit different uh, number uh, set than I do, but uh, the approach will be exactly the same. So I'm given uh, time series value data uh, for it looks like six weeks. I don't really know what the measurements are here, but that's not important uh, to help us understand the basics. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to plot this data uh, very simply, treat these as ordered pairs. And I think what you will do is you'll find that uh, time plot number two is uh, the one that matches this data. Uh, then it asks for a pattern. You know, there are some ups and downs here, but overall the performance is generally horizontal. So that's what uh, you'll see here. Uh, let's see, it picks plot two as the winner and then a horizontal pattern, that all makes sense. Just as a reminder, anytime you're dealing with data that can be uh, viewed visually, I uh, certainly recommend that you do that so that you understand what you're working with and that'll help you uh, in your, uh, your analytical approach to trying to understand this data. There are two methods that we're gonna look at here in problem one uh, in terms of forecast. The first one is called a three week moving average. And let's talk about that one first. So effectively what we wanna do is we're gonna use information about the previous three weeks to make an estimate in the current week. So if I'm in uh, week four of this time series data, I'm gonna use the actual results from time periods one, two, and three to make an estimate uh, for week four. And it's very simply done by taking the average of those three weeks. And as I get down to week five, instead of one, two, and three, I'll use weeks two, three, and four. And then for week six, I'll use three, four, and five. A uh, part of this wants you to make an estimate for week seven. So that's quite simple. We'll just use four, five, and six. <clears throat> and notice again, I'll give you this sheet when I post the video but I'm just using, again, the average of the three preceding weeks to come up with the forecast. Uh, the next question is, uh, how good is the forecast versus the actual value? And so as you go through the reading this week, be very careful to look at the error metrics. This idea of error metrics uh, will help you quantify the difference between the uh, actual value and the forecast, and that'll allow you to do some comparison of methods which we will actually do in this first problem, which is a good uh, sort of strategic overview of, uh, of the week. Uh, this first metric is called the mean square error. Uh, very simple. All you're going to do here for each week is take the difference between the actual and forecast value, and then you will square it. And that's exactly what I'm showing for this formula up here. And uh, so the mean square error for the week of, uh, or for week four, excuse me, about 21.8 units. Again, I'm not sure what we're measuring, so we'll just leave it at that. So after you go through and compute the mean square error for each uh, each of the four weeks that you, or actually the three weeks that you can, if you take the average of those three weeks, uh, the mean square error uh, on average is about 11.9 units. So that is the three-week moving average. Uh, then let's go down and look at this idea of exponential smoothing. Uh, very simply, what exponential smoothing does is it takes a portion of an actual value and a portion of an, a forecast from a previous period to come up with an estimate for the current period. <laughs> Excuse me. And so what you see here in uh, 6.5 Part C, uh, it's telling you to use an alpha value of 0.2. Now, this is a value that can be adjusted uh, by whoever's doing the analysis here. But when we see that uh, we're going to use an alpha value of 0.2, what that means is, uh, as I develop my forecast for week two, uh, what this tells me is that I'm going to use 20% of the actual value 
and one minus 0.2, which is a 0.8 or 80% of the forecast value to come up with the estimate for uh, this second week. Now, uh, obviously uh, in week one, I don't have a forecast value. So what I do in this case is I just use the actual value uh, as the forecast value. And that allows me to kick off this exponential smoothing drill. By the way, let me just mention, when you go through your reading, you will see this equation. Uh, I did not post the equation here or give you the equation, but what I want, what instead of doing that, what I wanna do is explain to you what's happening in that equation. But certainly when you go through the reading, make sure that you're, uh, that you're cognizant of this, uh, of this equation and make sure that you understand uh, that uh, once the alpha value is given, the complement of that effectively one minus the alpha value becomes the proportion of the forecast value that is used uh, when you come up with the forecast itself. So if I go to uh, week two, notice that I'm taking 20% of the time series value or the actual value, and then I'm adding to that 80% of the forecast, and that will give me uh, the forecast value for this period. Obviously, it'll be 18 because I'm taking 2% uh, of 18 or 20% of 18, then 80% of 18, and that's obviously gonna be 18. Uh, once you type that one time, if you just pull it right down, uh, that's, those cells will populate. And again, each, uh, in each week, we're taking 20% of the uh, actual value and 80% of the forecast. Then you can go over here, you can compute the MSE, and then right here, you can take the average uh, in this case, you are able to do it for five weeks. Uh, let's see, uh, 1303, uh, that's correct for the five weeks we're able to do this. Then it asked you for a forecast uh, for week seven. Same thing, uh, let's see, 20% of the, looks like I've got the formula a little bit backwards here, that's fine. It's just addition, 20% of the actual value 80% of the forecast value comes up with 15.53. And so uh, again, what I, what I kind of harped on here, this, uh, the, the, the idea of the, uh, the error metric allows us to compare which one of these methods was the better performer. And since I only have three weeks of uh, moving average data, what we'll do is we'll compare uh, the MSE for the three weeks of the three week moving average and we'll take the last three weeks, uh, weeks four, five, and six from the exponential smoothing. And notice since the, uh, the mean square error for the three week moving average is smaller than the exponential smoothing, then we will say at least in this case, uh, the three week moving average performed better. Let me just quickly go back and say, remember I said, uh, when you choose your value for alpha in an exponential smoothing, uh, it, it's very possible and it's, it's very likely that uh, we could come up with a combination of alpha and its complement that would produce error metrics that show that this is actually a better method than the three, three week moving average. It's just trying to figure out the balance between the actual value and the previous forecast value to help us minimize that error metric. And that's something that comes with some practice and uh, some manipulation in Excel data spreadsheet, I will say, but it's, it's quite simple to do if that's something that you're interested in. But uh, you can certainly hone that in and dial that in uh, with some adjustments to the alpha value and its complement. Okay, so let's see, 619, uh, let's see. There we go. Uh, let's see, another set of data. Uh, I have, uh, let's see, I've actually plotted it out itself. I think, again, the winner here is, uh, is plot number two. Uh, the thing that you'll notice about this one is as the time period goes on, the data appears to be uh, decreasing in all cases. And so uh, from this idea of trend, is it trending upward or downward? In this case, we would say uh, the trend is downward. <laughs> and so in this case, uh, what we're going to do for an estimating technique is we're going to use linear regression. And uh, if you remember your studies in uh, Systems 506 or a previous stats class, uh, you remember that linear regression just basically takes, and this simple linear regression takes bivariate data, plots it, and then comes up with, using some statistical measures, comes up with a way to develop what's called a line of best fit. 
And again, that's produced uh, statistically. And I'm going to show you a couple ways to do this in Excel. So again, here's my time series data. I have uh, transposed it over here into my Excel spreadsheet. Let's see, let me get rid of this to show you how I uh, produce this. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to plot the data first. And so if I highlight the data and I go up to insert in the middle of that uh, palette, there are some charts that we can use. The first one is a scatter plot. Just click on that. And that plots our data. The first way to come up with the uh, uh, regression results, if you put your cursor on just one of these ordered pairs, just right click. Then if you add a trend line, uh, we certainly want it to be linear and then display the equation on the chart. Uh, let's see if I can get rid of this. Close that, yep. And let me highlight this home, make this a little bigger so we can all see it. So this is the line of best fit. What is this? It's the equation of this line. Notice what it does not do. It does not uh, weave back and forth to connect all the dots. It is the line that best, best fits this from a statistical standpoint. But we're going to use that instead of using a three-week moving average or a, an exponential time series or an exponential smoothing approach. We will use this uh, linear equation to come up with our uh, with our forecast values. Uh, let's see. Over here, it's asking for what is the uh, the y-intercept. Remember that the y-intercept is the constant value in the regression equation. In the slope. Uh, B1 is the coefficient of X. What are they? 4.929. That looks right if you uh, round that to three decimal places. So if I take this equation down here, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, instead of, uh, or uh, along with the actual value, I'm going to come up with a forecast value. And notice that I can come up with a forecast value for each one of the seven time periods by simply substituting the time value, whether it's one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven in for X. And then, uh, let's see, I don't know if I can change that from X. To, actually, I can change that to T. Maybe that's more helpful. I'm glad I didn't uh, think about that. That's probably helpful for you all. Uh, so time, enter the time period uh, for T, and then you can come up with a forecast. So I'll give you this sheet. Remember, your data might be a little bit different, but uh, minus 4.9. 286 times, and I'm just using a cell reference, B33, which is T1, and then plus 119.71. Uh, if you hit that, enter, you get the forecast. And again, it's just very simple. Since you're using cell references, just pull this straight down, and then you will have uh, the forecast estimates. Then it wants to know, uh, it's asking for the MSE. So uh, let me see, that's covered up. So let me just do this, actually. Once I do that, I trick it and it moves off that value. Uh, if you come up with a, with a mean square error for each time period, again, it's just the difference between the actual and the forecast. You square that if you take the average 11.408, which is what we're seeing here. And then uh, let's see, a average or a, uh, an estimate for time period eight. Uh, again, just use the regression equation. I'm coming up with something. They're coming up with 80.286. I'm thinking that's a mistake uh, on that third decimal place because I'm coming up with uh, 80.282, and I've done that a number of times, and I'm pretty certain that's correct. So just uh, just be careful of that when you input your uh, answers into Cengage and uh, make sure that they don't treat you bad on that. Uh, if they do, let me know, and I can... Uh, I can certainly give you back points on that, but that uh, should be fairly straightforward. Uh, let's see, is there anything else here? I think that covers uh, 619. So what I'm gonna do in 625, I'm gonna end this, uh, this tutorial here. In 625, I will show you the other Excel method that you can use on the regression piece. So I'll see you uh, on uh, problem 625.